My name is Alex Behunin, and I'll explain later. In episode 7, I sit down with alternative psychologist Michael Walker. We talk about his traumatic childhood and what led him to seek help. He explains depth psychology, soul work, dream work, and more. To learn more, please visit Self Integration Advocate on Facebook. Enjoy. All right, I'm here with Michael Walker, an alternative psychologist. Thanks for doing this. No problem. Um, so where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in, I guess, mm, that's a tough question. I, I was, a, I was a adopted a foster home, and then um, I grew up in, the, I was adopted out of Bakersfield. Okay. So I grew up in and out of uh, Kern County, and the before five, I was in Barstow, Bakersfield, and then I was in Fresno from from five years old to twelve. Then I went back to Kern County. Were you with the same family? Uh, my adopted family f- there f- in Fresno. Uh, but with a, with a stepdad, and then uh, I went with my adopted dad at, in Taft when I was 12, and then by by 13 I was out on my own. Wow! And I've lived in Dallas and all over, back in Fresno, all yeah. So, um, when when did you end up coming down to Ventura? Uh, in 2009. So, when did you get into psychology? Well, that that's a long that's a long mm-hmm. scope because uh, I would say I had a I was I. I worked at the, I ended up, my last official job mm. was in the railroad. Okay. I was a conductor for the railroad, and um, I got sick with an autoimmune disease. Wow. I had arthritis in my whole body, and my spine was fusing. Um, I couldn't walk. Uh, I was having, I, I couldn't breathe. Sometimes my um, lungs would get inflamed with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I had chronic dislocations. Uh, in my shoulders, multiple multiple times because it's enthesitis. It's part. It's part of the. It's part of the ankylosing spondylitis. I I do believe there was some toxicity <laughs> at the railroad, right. but uh, since it's not indicated in the literature, the medical literature, it didn't work out that way. Right. Uh, and so it just was an autoimmune disease that happens normally when you're around two men predominantly when they're around 28, and then they you have a gene that they a gene marker that they look at. To as part of the diagnosis, which I had, and so I retired from the the railroad. So your question was, how did I get into psychology? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, when you lose your career, and you lose your religion, and you lose, and then soon after, I lost my family uh, because you're in chronic fa- pain and you can't walk. Uh, you start to ask questions, and so psychology seemed a, a legitimate place. So I had found a, um, a psychologist and he ended up becoming my mentor. So he was a psychologist, uh, Dr. Marika, and um, he also was a uh, priest, mm. Catholic priest. And so um, he was not doing psychology. We were entering into a relationship and I was learning things. And uh, it, that's when I started really getting into psychology. And so. I had the advantage of from oh, when I start seeing him from 2001 until well even t- to this day but until I started um, figuring out how to heal myself mm-hmm. I had from 2001 until I would say 2013 I was in my own I, I had time to, to, to research to read to meditate to work on finding my cure and so that's when I started studying in in depth, all the different modalities, not only in psychology but kinesiology and literature and mythology. And Were you going to school at this time? I had s- I have I had been going to school um, a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit all the time, um, as much as I could based on what I my, my condition would allow me to do. Right. So. Uh, so and you, what did your condition? So were you just immobilized? Where like what can you kind of describe was that? I was uh, I my spine was fusing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had arthritis in my spine and sacrum, <sighs> lumbar, and I had uh, arthritis in both of my knees, um, to name a few. So as I was going through the counseling with Dr. Marika and doing the medical uh, whatever, I went to actually to Marika because 
um, before I was I was drinking alcohol to medicate the pain, and then when that wasn't working, I was drinking alcohol and taking oxycotton right. for the pain because I was always at around an eight pain on a zero to ten. Right. And so after a while, you just start to become uh, mad, literally. <laughs> you become you become uh, crazy, and, uh, and not being able to get around. Uh, plus, with all the stuff that was going on, you know, loss of all the loss. So I um. Uh, you had asked something, I forgot. But how, how did you heal yourself, I guess? Is this yeah, so I went to, <coughs> I mean, that's where I was going. So uh, I finally couldn't stand the symptoms of, you know, the side effects of the drugs right. uh, for multiple reasons. So I went to Marika. And then as I went to Marika, uh, started working and working. And then um, he, and then at some point around 2000, and I'm going to say around 2007, um, it just kind of came up, you know. Well, what? Am, what's my diagnosis? Do why? Why, how, why are you know? What's the you know the official diagnosis here? And uh, he, he was he 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 looked at me and he said, uh, "You're um, you have developmental trauma. You've been traumatized your whole life, mm. y you know." And it just it just it was a it was, uh, and it was a breakthrough. It was a cathartic breakthrough to know that. And I immediately knew that the pain and everything was connected to the trauma that was never spoken of. Imme immediately, it was just, it was a cathartic moment. And I was like, that's when I started going into the somatic, the um, ideas, alternative, um, alternative uh, therapy, which they call body work therapy. And at the time, that was, that was just coming out where they were, were uh, there were a few. There were a few people who were working with um, uh, autoimmune disease as trauma, mm -hmm. not PTSD, but developmental trauma. And there's a, there's a big difference. It's called complex trauma in the DMS five. And um, uh, and I was started working with them, but then I was also doing Jungian work with Marika. I was doing active imagination, and so I did both of those to get basically get healed. Wherever my dreams and my active imagination would take me, I would follow it. Huh. And it would always lead me into diverse subjects and diverse things. Literally had a dream of a lady with a red hat and I would come out and see a lady in the red hat. I would follow her and she would go into a, an acupuncture place and say, let me look into acupuncture. I would just follow, I mean, follow those energies. And then it led me to all the new, all the new stuff. I mean, uh, and connecting stuff that didn't even that were, was never really connected before. And so, I knew before the big all the neuroscience came out on trauma, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know that everyone's talking about now. I already, I already knew. What I, I, I had already, uh, I mean, was doing it. Right. Or you know, I didn't have that precise of language. But uh, I already knew that. I was like, yeah, of course. And I was like, this is great. And the trauma that you're talking about is just you're growing up by being adopted, trauma like, like that? Yeah. So, for it, so yes, I'll specifically, the difference between developmental trauma and, and PTSD is that uh, the, so the, the limbic, just really quickly, the limbic system is the animal part of the brain right behind the prefrontal cortex. So the I our ego idea of who we are is a conception of the of the prefrontal cortex, and it puts you in time and space, okay? And its job is to govern information. It literally limits the amount of information that you take in so you don't go crazy, okay? <laughs> and the limbic system doesn't work that way. The limbic system is directly connected to your body's, it's a very direct route to your body's working functions and your emotions. And so that's where the the fight or flight or the sleep sex, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system are. So when a trauma happens to you or something excitable happens, the limbic system turns on and tells, okay, we don't need your brain working anymore because it's limiting information. And so it turns on its fight or flight. And if you are constantly as a child, now remember from the perception of a child, not from our perception as an adult to how we would experience the child, that's what we do to children. It's the child's weak position and also their interdependent nature that causes so much damage that's different. And so 
when you're traumatized as a child or the perception of a child that, that, that the child has that this is a bad situation um, and they're not able to either fight, which they're too young or they're too weak or they have too much bonding with the, with the perpetrators, right. or they're not able to run because they're forced to stay with the perpetrators, then that causes, the, that causes a disruption of the, dis of the limbic system. And then at some point, in order to cope with that, it go, the, the brain goes into its third area of defense, which is into the reptile stem, and it dissociates into a freeze response. And so depending on certain triggers, the body completely turns off. Hmm. And so it depends on the trauma or whatever like that. But my particular traumas were, yes, being adopted, not having any uh, loving figures for the first year or two, uh, and then having, so that's completely had its own cycle that I had to work through. Right. Um, being adopted into a family that did not work, that did not have any bonding in it, um, uh, and then a divorce soon after that, <laughs> which is <laughs> enough, which, which would be enough, uh, right. and then a stepdad after that that was abusive. It's like Goodwill Hunting kind of on crack, right. um, <laughs> but without any gifts, <laughs> right, right, right. you know, and then out on my own at 13. Right. Um, so, and I was functionally illiterate until I was 21. So I didn't, you know, I only had eighth grade education at the time. And so there was a lot of, there was a lot of trauma, but I was never able to see that. So that's part of the, dis, the, the freeze response, to dissociate. So once you started diving into all that trauma. Yes. That's when your body was was starting to heal. Yes. Huh. Because when when a child is unable to deal with the trauma, and especially when it's from zero to five, right. that doesn't mean that the that the body that the that you don't have the trauma. Um, the 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 trauma is remembered through the body, hmm. and it speaks. It's constantly speaking, and it speaks beautifully. It almost, it, the symptoms that one has is almost speaking directly to, as though it was just a clear witness, if you, if you, if you learn to see. Huh. And that's kind of what we, that's kind of what I do. I, I, you <laughs> know, so whether or not they're coming with a symptom, a psychological symptom, that they're thinking is a symptom, right? Mm -hmm. I don't view it as a symptom. That's another thing. I don't view, I don't view what most people are going through as symptoms because that's a pathologized way to look at the universe and look at the sickness. If you're looking at it from more of a trauma and a soul model, um, it, you're, looking at a, you're looking at more of a destiny, like the body, this is how the body and the mind and the soul is speaking to lead them to what their purpose is. Huh. What is an alternative psychologist? Well, that, the alternative psychology is just a fancy legal word for you're doing something of a psychological nature but you're not doing it under a license. Gotcha. And and I won't do uh, any work under a license because I just don't believe I just don't believe that it that it works. When did you come to that real realization? The minute uh, Marika told me that I had trauma, hmm. and that Western medicine had completely failed me on a psychological level, social level, uh, physical level, uh, not just Western medicine, but the whole. Uh, modern idea of psychology too. It just had completely it had completely failed me and I was left you know basically left rotting um, you know until I died. So explain depth psychology and kind of explain soul work. Well depth, psych depth psychology is from uh, is uh, I guess coined from James Hillman and he was a student of Carl Jung. Okay. Okay and so it's, it's, a, it's a branch off of Jungian psychology the reality is, is that um, you're hard pressed to find a school in in America. I don't really know many. You, there's a few that are analytical, which are Freud, which are the line before Jung, and the analytical side. You can get an, a degree in analytical psychology um, and get licensed. That's tough. There's not a lot. Why is that? Um, well, I have my I have my ideas mm -hmm. about why that is. Um, it's it's e it's easier to you make more money. Now this is cynical. <laughs> you you make more money by having people constantly in a theoretical framework that they're constantly sick. 
Yeah. So if if the if a person doesn't believe that they are they're made of the stars, so to speak, and they have some type of uh, personal destiny or and some vocation like the Greeks and the Romans. That, that your your personal daemon was a representative, not demon. The, the Christians turn that into the word demon. The daemon is a representative of between you and the gods of your destiny, and it protects your destiny. Hmm. And um, like for instance, the birthdays in the Greek and Roman tradition were basically a celebration of your daemon, of your life's purpose, of this kind of entity that sits outside of here then he and the daemon is connected to the fates or the morai mm. so um, if you don't have that type of understanding of your life and science has spent a hundred years telling you that you are just a, a a bag of flesh with blood with some with some neurons firing here and there then you're left with a psychology that is behavioral and cognitive. Mm. And, and, and the analytical psychology was, um, even to Jung and then to depth psychology, is, is assuming that there is something unconscious, something deeper, and it smacks too much of morality and spirituality um, for the general scientific mind or the age of science. And so that would be one of the reasons why it's, it's, you can't even get a license in it in general. And so it, not only is it just a alternative, um, it's, it's mocked probably by the general, you, you get a, you get a chapter in a, of it in a, you know, in your, in a psychology class, mm -hmm. in a general breath psychology class. And that's about all you'll get of, you know, well, that's that wacky Freud stuff that's been whatever. And then there was the young, but that's not even Right. You know, and you might get hear about it when some uh, off the wall teacher wants to talk about Joseph Campbell and Joseph Campbell's influence with uh, you know with Nietzsche and Jung. Right. You know, and and, and then you go into Star Wars and screen you know screen screenplay right. writing, and so it it it, it, le it leaves psychology r rather quickly. But I don't do just depth psychology. I I mean that's a core principle of what I do. I'm mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's a lot of things in it that are beautiful. So, um, but I do, but it is a part of what I do, but you asked me what, soul, what um, depth psychology is. Mm -hmm. The aspects of depth psychology that I use are, are, the, soul, are the soul work. Okay. Um, and primarily, Jung believed in an unconscious and uh, the conscious and the unconscious. James Hillman took it a de step further, and I believe this too. He believes that that still has an hi a hierarchy. So consciousness is superior, that prefrontal cortex, and the unconscious is something that you can't know, right? And so they're constantly battling with one another. And I, I believe, like Hillman, he believed that they're both equal and that, and that one is waking consciousness and one is an imaginative consciousness. And you have to learn how, and they both are speaking very clearly. <coughs> and so just that's a radical idea and it and it forces one out of this idea that there's a whole world that they're not they're not allowed to know right so how would you treat someone come someone walks into into your office or gets in touch with you and has some trauma like what's the soul work with that person like okay so so the first radical concept is that I'm not I'm not going to treat anyone because that's that's a pathological, that's a pathological function, okay. right? So yes, because the people are psychologized into into looking at their experience as a as a as a pathology, right? As a sickness, I they'll come in. Whether or not they're they're diagnosed with something already, or they've self-diagnosed, or they've got bad diagnosis. Right. I mean, there's whole medical. There's whole medical professionals that just spend their whole time undiagnosing bad diagnosis. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. I mean, that's a real that's a real profession, uh, and and not only that, they have in the insurance side of the universe, they have a whole they have a whole uh, 
idea. They even have a word for it, and they have a whole department, and it's called ATL. It's not ATology. It's called uh, iatro uh, iatrogenic. I think that's the word. Anyways, I used to know it, but <laughs> it's, it's, I'm blanking. But anyways, it's the concept that actual the actual medical work, whether it's psychology or a medical practice, actually causes more harm than good. Hmm. And so you get sued because of that. And so uh, there's lots of there's lots of problems with uh, psychology and and the and the symptoms. So when people come in, they're going to speak about it in a symptom. They're going to say, "I have." Um, I'm having marital problems. Um, I have I have chronic depression. I um, I have uh, PTSD. I, I have a chronic uh, you know autoimmune disease, some type of rheumatoid arthritis, or what's the other one where um, uh, it's very common. Anyways, yeah, they'll come in with a symptom. So the idea of soul work is that the soul. Um, where Jung, Jung would call it the anima, the feminine, the feminine part, um, it speaks through the symptoms if you force it only the language of pathology. Mm. It's actually speaking through the symptoms. And so when the person comes in, they're immediate, I'm immediately looking, not trying to undo the symptoms, not trying to give symptom reduction. We literally are going into the heartbeat of the of the of what it's trying to say, what it's crying out, mm. and it's uh, it's just a liberating process. I mean, for for me too, what, being a part of it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing. So, can you treat it with trauma, depression, addiction, the whole gamut? Well, I think the science is in that trauma, addiction, autoimmune diseases, even some cancers. I think the the medical science is in. And that it is all it all is related to developmental trauma or complex trauma. Hmm. I think it's I mean you pretty much could just say that this is this is similar to Columbus saying the earth is round. So when they so when they come in with the when they come in with their symptoms, they're going to tell me that. But when we start when I start working with the dreams, they don't even. There's also a defensive mechanism in place too that's that's there, and so it doesn't matter. Wherever they, wherever that, because we, I'm, I'm looking at where the, what, what the soul is really wanting to say, and at the same time, the soul is really wanting to say it. They want to express it, and at the same time, they're saying, I don't want to do that because I don't want. There's, there's a reason why I don't have access to these, this energy, right. memory, whatever, right? And so there's, con they're constantly roadblocking you too. So, it wherever they put a defense up, so let's say they're too smart for their own good. We we all know these people. They're all. I mean, they're so smart that they outsmart like Goodwill Hunting. They outsmart the psychologist, right? Right. Um, then I'll go to the body symptoms. We'll start working on the body symptoms. That lead us. That lead us to the same exact place. What would you look for in the body symptoms? Oh well, they'll, everyone's got symptoms. Body symptoms when they have any type of whether it's depression or like whatever. What? Uh, you could you, they could it could be over they could be overweight they could be um, there could be addiction that that has its own symptomology um, they could have chronic headaches they could have they could actually have chronic injuries that are happening insomnia um, it just depends and then they could actually have a symptom right sitting in front of you that they've never had before and then I'll ask them about a dream they'll say well I don't know what this is I've never had this before and I'll ask them about a dream they'll tell me about a dream and then they'll tell me. And then they'll start talking about the dream. We'll start. An we'll start. Not. I don't really analyze dreams. I. I think that's that old model. I think the dreams are speaking a poetic language, and so the and very eloquently to what needs to be done. Dreams. Dreams are very fascinating to me. Um, do you, how do you decipher a dream? Well, the well the old well if you live in if, in the the psychological age or the scientific age we live in, then it's just a it's just a. It's just a matter of a bad meal you had before you went to bed, or um, your brain is processing garbage, um, or whatever like that. And I don't believe any of that. I don't believe any of that. I believe that that is the imaginative consciousness, and it is speaking very clearly and very directly. I mean, when I hear a dream, I tell people all the time because they, they, they people come to me and they're like, 
it's like a, it's almost like a, a a party gag, right, or something like that. You know, so it's um, oh, let me. You do dreams. Let me let me tell you a dream, and I, I I really, in all honesty, tell them. Do you understand when you tell me your dream? I'm gonna know more about you than you even know about yourself. I mean, uh, you are gonna tell me so much about you, hmm. and and they just can't fathom that until we actually sit down and do a dream, and then they're just completely. They think it's almost like a Jedi mind trick, or a you know, and it, and it's not. It, it's. It, the imaginative part of the of the soul, which I would call more the spirit, not the soul. I would call that the uh, I call that the animus. Um, that's the masculine part. Um, I think it speaks very clearly. So how how did you learn about that? Because I have a dream book in my house. You know, the absolute <laughs> garbage, in my opinion. Right. I mean, when I when everything about anything that we're going to talk about, just it's. Think of the Christopher Columbus. The Earth is. I'm saying the Earth is round, and everyone else is saying it's flat. Right. And I'm going to stay c constant on that until everyone understands <laughs> that it's round. Uh, so dream books, yeah, it's garbage because it's it's ba it's based on um, it's based on that you can't remember something, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you just kind of follow it, it's hinting at something that that you know through association, you finally get to the thing. And what I and what I'm what I'm saying is is that memory is a confabulation. No matter what you do, you you are taking a story, a fable, and you're putting it together. So a confabulation, and and you're and you're and you're putting it together the best that you can. There's no way that you can act, and and you can't even accurately, even if you had a videotape of the memory you had, is that even accurate? Right to the whole sensation, the whole the whole dynamic that's going on. Can you? Is that even accurate? And so there's this, this idea that you can o there's only so much accuracy you can have. So the dream is saying the way they, you do in dream books, you interpret it as there's only so much accuracy, so it's just kind of getting us close to something. So I would say the opposite. I would say that there's so much information that your body is able to bring in, that your mind, that your soul is able to bring in, and it's on purpose that it brought in before, right? It even came into an existence that the stories that it puts together in the dream or you're an imaginative process, mm -hmm. the stories it puts together or how the culture creates things, right? We're all putting, making stories together by the words we use, how we devise words, how we devise theoretical frameworks and concepts. These are all part of this dreaming idea or this, this imaginative idea. And what I'm saying is, is that it, it is actually speaking more accurate than anything than anything that we have that could the videotape or anything because it's taking in the emotions, the pain, the insight, all of this data that the unconscious, the so-called unconscious takes in that the prefrontal cortex just doesn't know how to compute, right? But we're still taking the information in and it puts all of this complex information into imagery and that imagery is able to hold all of the dynamics of it. And so to me, it's truer than anything. So as soon as I hear a dream or someone accidentally uses a word or someone, you know, or the culture does something uh, or in an act of imagination they say something, um, to me it's more clear than any, anything that they could tell me or anything a diagnosis or if you fill out a you know, questionnaire could ever do. Hmm. So bare bones, like what do you, what would you define as a dream? So you're saying that a dream is, it's, it's not just you, you go to sleep and it's just memories or something you saw on TV and you dream it up. It's no, if you if you have a dream, one of the best things you could do is to wake up and honor that dream, just like one would a, a deity in the old or uh, in the old pagan religions, or even the Christian would do in the in the dark ages. Right? You would you would give it you would you would give a devotion to it and. Um, because it is literally telling you who you are at that moment, where you're at, and all of the insight more than you could ever you could ever do by any other means. And what and you have to learn its language. It's to to me, it's a simple language. I mean, it's just it's it's a language. Right. Um, but if you if you believe it's in this unconscious thing, 
or the scientific thing where you're just a bag of, it's just, you know, you had heartburn or, you know, <laughs> whatever, uh, or there's some synapses misfiring, then, uh, then of course, it doesn't have any, any significance. But I think that's a, I think that's a, so, it's so full of shit. There's so much in the dream. I mean, when you learn it, what happens is is that you you see the brilliance of it. You see the literally the light, right? That sh it's shining into the universe, and aspect from your perspective, right? Because here's another here's another conceptual framework. So um, when when a thousand years ago, when we realized that the Earth isn't geocentric, that it's solar centric, right? Mm -hmm. That the earth is actually going around the sun, that the sun isn't going around the earth. We also at the same time, um, the, Roman, the Roman emperor around 300 destroyed all of the temples, all of the Greek gods and goddesses, especially Avesta, which is the, um, which Vesta was the, the goddess of the hearth, the center of the home. She also was the goddess of the center of the city of Rome, where we have the Olympic flame is from the Vestan Mm. the vestial virgins that kept the sacred flame the heart of the city the heart of the home was represented in, in, the, in the where you cooked and so at the same time that we understood that we no longer are the center of the earth, center of the world of the universe we also lost the center of the idea that we are from we are the center of us has something important to say and so now we're just these this is the beginning of science right now we're just this blob of dead earth and we're dead matter that's just floating around aimlessly around something, right. right? And so when you understand that the dream is the center of something beautiful and that you have, you, you, you are something more than just matter, right? Then the dream speaks so eloquently that you actually use it like the, my glasses. My dream of, the, of, the, of that night are actually like a, like a lens. And I and I can see I'm like literally dreaming at the same time that I'm awake. So what if someone doesn't dream, or they the dream maybe two times a week? Is that something? Yeah, I believe I I believe that is super common mm -hmm. um, because we've been so disconnected from our from from ourselves. So I believe that's a sign of trauma, developmental trauma. I believe it's a sign of the, being completely disconnected, being completely ignored. I mean I mean you can feel it. You can feel it when people, it's palpable when people have, ne they've never been seen, let alone seen themselves. And so, of course, they're not dreaming. But you come in, I, I get this, I wouldn't say like 75% of the time. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember my dreams. I don't even know when I, can ha when I have a dream. I say, tell me any dream that you can remember. Oh, I can't. You haven't remembered one dream. And they'll tell me, oh, it was some silly dream. And they'll tell me, it would be like, you know, there was this one time I went up top of the mountain and there was a monster and he ate me and I woke up. <laughs> I'm like, great. We start working on that. And before you know it, There's within t in 15 minutes, all of a sudden, uh, we've w th that imagery has opened up because that's d different than a dream book. Actually be in with the image. R work with the image. What is that? Get in the body. Get in the experiential thing. Because that, that's where, because we're out of our body. Right. We're not even in our body. And our body's like giving us these symptoms to say, we're, we're, I'm alive, I'm awake, I'm holding on. And so we, I get it, we can get into it really quick. I have people that can't even remember a dream way back. And I just say, tell me your favorite movie. Remember, because the, the, our collective conscious creates these movies too. Even if there's legitimate archetypes, and even like, for instance, the Star Wars had some legitimate archetypes. And then they went with these new things and went what I would call simulations of, of archetypes. They got, it got so bastardized, right? right? And so it's the same thing. So even, even within uh, modern movies or modern tropes, so like, uh, like for instance, uh, what's the uh, uh, Game of Thrones, right? G these great archetypes, this great intense story and then somewhere in season what five or whatever it just it went into D&D &D, uh, you know weird right. whatever so but there's still truth in the archetypes it's just you have to learn how to get them out so when someone tells me I don't have a dream but they tell me their favorite story oh I liked um, I remember 
uh, Sleeping Beauty. I love Sleeping Beauty. We start analyzing Sleeping Beauty, not analyzing, but getting into it, going with it, and all of a sudden, you know, yeah, my uh, I was raised just by my mom, and my aunt would come help, and then but my mom was super mean, and you know, and then their name literally, you know, they called her Rose, and I mean, it's just the weird that it's uncanny that people they we're dreaming all the time. The things we pick aren't accidental. So if someone comes in with, with a dream that they've, it's a dream of someone they went to high school with that they haven't seen in 15 years. Okay. What is that? We, I mean, I would need to know what the dream. I, I mean, uh, we like what, what, what was happening in the dream? Where, where were you at in the dream? Was there a beginning, middle, and end? See, I also believe that dreams have a beginning, middle, and end. Gotcha. And so my job is to kind of narr is to put a narrative function on it, and and they'll they'll with a little bit of help they they're like oh yeah there's a narrative there. What about nightmares? They're those are the best. Hmm. I, I if you if I always say if you have a nightmare tell me the nightmare first. Hmm. We can get right to it. Is it the same approach as a dream? Is it super same approach except it's so much easier to get to it's so much easier to get to the emotions or the nightmare because if that's um, I remember my my mentor. Um, one of the one of the things I remember clearly, I was telling him about a dream because we did dream work, and um, I was saying there I was with this lady. I don't know who she was, and uh, there was this lady in black coming up behind us, and then there was a there was a man coming in front of us. And we were on the sidewalk, and this lady she comes over, and I was I got the feeling like she was a witch, and then she went past us and just stabbed this dude right in the heart, right in front of me, killed him right in front of me. I was like, she just did this right in front of me. So without going into the rest of the dream, I remember just like saying, I was just so mad and so furious that she would do that in front of me or whatever like that. I mean, can you, I mean she just killed a man right in front of me. And I was, I was in the emotion of it, right? And the horror of it and all that. See, this is where the imagery gets all of these nuances that you can't just say, I was angry. So you were just angry, right? Or you were, you were just scared or you were just, Whatever I mean, it the imagery, the story tells you all of the nuances. Hmm. There's all I need to protect the lady I'm with. What about this man? Why didn't I? The shame and the guilt. Why didn't I see this before? If I knew that there, you know, it is this complex, rich thing that you can't just get with a questionnaire. With with the three emotions we're allowed to feel. Right. You know what I mean? There's all these beautiful, complex things. So I was feeling it, and I remember Marika looking at me and going, um, "Have you ever thought?" that that's the only way that your soul could get your attention because you're so pig-headed? Does that literally have to murder someone in front of you? And so, yes, dream uh, nightmares are, are wonderful because we get so dense, we get so dull to listening, to honoring. Um, remember, I believe that if you want things to be sacred, I mean, things in your life to have sa have sacred places, to have sacred things, to have parts of your own self to be sacred. You have to care for them. The, it's the act of caring for something that makes it sacred. It's, it's that devotional act. It, it's kind of the chicken or egg kind of a thing. It's sacred so you take care of it, but you taking care of it keeps it sacred. And so if you don't keep, if you don't give yourself a care and, um, and a, and a self-respect and a dignity then it's going to cry out until you do. And nightmares and body symptoms and other symptoms and horrible relationships because you project that same thing out into, into the world. Mm. And so it, it'll, it'll cry out. So d d nightmares are wonderful. So, uh, so dream work and that, that falls into soul, like soul work? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, what else do you do? Um, I will connect... Uh, eventually, once the person is not being ravaged anymore by, you know, their own destiny, their own soul, uh, then I, I think one of the, the major problems with um, how we deal with medicine and mental illness in the West or in the modern age is that it's completely the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Your cardiologist does not know what your general practitioner is doing. They don't know what the psychologist is doing. The psychologist doesn't know what the, psychi the psychiatrist drugs are giving you. They don't know what the physical therapist is doing. 
And so you have a mess, and this is super common. Um, and so what I, so what I, one of my, one of the things that I did to, to, to heal myself is I realized as soon as I was dealing with the underlying psychic functions, right, I was getting my soul in line. I was seeing what it had to say and it was releasing, you know, it was allowing me movement. Literally, my spine isn't fusing anymore. Um, I don't have arthritis in my knees. I don't, my lungs don't get, um, you know, messed up. I, uh, you know, I lost 60 pounds. Um, I'm almost 50. Um, I'm probably healthier than most 20 year olds. Right. Um, as soon as you that released, I realized that there's a whole, uh, you can deal with the psychological part or the soul part, right? But if the body has been hampered for decades, it's still left in that, in that chronic uh, traumatized state, right? So there's all these muscle imbalances, weaknesses, uh, the parts that are atrophied, parts that are too strong to compensate for all of this, all of this traumatic, traumatic issues because it is phys physiological. There's no way you can separate that. So this idea of psychosomatic is bullshit to me. The word psychosomatic is correct. It is the soul, psy psyche means soul mm -hmm. in Greek, and somatic is the body. It's the soul and the body are one. Yeah, that's correct. But we interpret that as you are ma a person is making up their physical symptoms. I don't agree with that at all. I believe that I believe that's a feedback system, and I believe the science is in on that too. And so, um, I soon realized I was getting a lot better with my psychological soul part of myself. And yet my body was still triggering all the old wounds even though I didn't have anything there because I was still had a limp. I had, uh, you know, to, to compensate for the back pain and the, and whatever, and I, because I, all, and the cane and the dislocations. I had, didn't have any range of motion on my shoulders and all this kind of stuff. So I, I realized I had to phys I had to find my own physical therapy because there was no, you can't go to a physical therapist and say, I only have X amount of range of motion on my shoulder. It's like, well, do you have a surgery? Because you know, if not, we. I mean, if you can, if you can tie your shoe, then that's all the insurance will pay for, mm. right? But that's not what the uh, you know. Can you can you get around now? That's all the insurance will pay for. And so I had to figure out and devise. That's why I learned all this kinesiology and movement theory, um, <clears throat> even to uh, a guy named Feldenkrais and Thomas Hanna. And uh, I integrated that with the trauma work and the depth psychological work. And so I correct, I was, I started to correct my lack of flexibility and the neuropathy within my legs, um, the muscle imbalances, and it's completely different than how you would, what you would normally think of in, in physical therapy. I mean, I spent a whole, I spent a whole year walking on sand super slow when I first started walking, 100, 100 yards, then 200 yards, and then half a mile, and then a mile, and then just on sand barefoot. So all of those secondary muscles, peripheral muscles, stabilizing muscles could be activated again, mm. right? I stopped any type of frontal plane work, like push-ups, things where you did, you know, uh, presses, things like that, and, and did, and they were also bilateral, right? I did unilateral send uh, the outside plane, the sagittal plane work, right? And, and, and started strengthening those muscles. I strengthened all what they call the rotator cuff muscles on my shoulders and didn't do any anterior strength work, which is right. flexing the body. I was extending the body and strengthening all those muscles until they were as strong as my pecs and my and my deltoids and my serratus, hmm. and so do you? Do you have you ever heard of anything like that? No, no, not at all, not no. at all. And this is just 101 basic stuff. Once you once you open your eyes, you see how dynamic the body is. I mean, I had to learn all of the agonistic antagonistic parts, all the secondary muscles, where they go. I even fixed tennis elbow and a golf elbow that they say you can't fix. Mm -hmm. 
based on muscle imbalance. The trip. Um, so what's your stance on medication? Um, are you against antidepressants and, and stuff like that? People can do whatever they want to do. I, but when they come to me, we're doing, we're, uh, at no time am I telling anyone not to do whatever they're doing. Right. So this is how, so stories are the best way to talk about it, right? Because the soul, that's what I, that's what I do. So when you come into, you come into a doctor, you come into a psychologist, you're wanting them to heal you. So you're looking for a healer, basically, in the old, in the old model. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a healer. I'm, I, uh, if you know, I don't know if you've read or seen the movie Lord of the Rings, yes. Fellowship of the Rings. I view myself as a ranger. If you're if you're coming to me, Western medicine has failed you. Your little trite, little Shire Hobbit existence, and your your ha- your stature as a half man, not even fully developed yet, because society has thrown you under the bus, right? You're thinking the Shire is working. It's not. So the Nazgul are coming for you, and you don't even know what to do, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, you can be on opiates. Uh, you can be on. You can be on medication for your uh, for your depression. You can be on Prozac. You can be on Ritalin for your ADHD. Uh, you can you can do you can be whatever you want to be. But to me, at some point, my job is to get you to Rivendale. Mm-hmm. I know orcs. I know the forest, I know disabilities, I know pain, I know addiction, I know abandonment, I know, I know all those Nazguls. I know, I know what lurks in there and I know how to get to Rivendell too, right? <laughs> right? And so, you, that's fine. You can, you can be on Prozac, you can, be, you, can, you can not show up, not do the dream work, not do the whatever for two or three weeks. To me, that's just like, does he know about second breakfasts? And lunchies and and whatever that's fine, I'm not you know. But we got to get to Rivendale. Here's an apple. Let's go. So if you can get there on Prozac and you can get there on whatever that that's fine. But at some point, you get caught up in the journey. The story it, it enraptures you. So is so is it kind of like med medication is kind of a band aid to you? It's it's just a, it's like a little temporary fix. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go one step further. Okay. In 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 my stance with it um, and and like I said not saying because I legally can't say no one should do it right. um, what I'm saying is is that our whole culture American culture one of its one of its foundations is drug is drugs alcohol opium it, it, the very you know it's kind of a sinister nature of, 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 of our culture and it's left such a swath of destruction that it's a, it's a spirit right literally like alcohol is called spiritus right it's it's literally a spirit in the old way of conceptualizing that puts you in a, in a higher in a different state and any drug can do that but it's caused so much damage and has so much negative aspects to it and so many side effects even in the commercials <laughs> right uh, that I, I think that it's a, I think it's something that um, you you play with at your at your own risk. I'm not yeah, I, I really do. I, I always I always wonder the placebo effect or 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 a, a test group that doesn't take anything. If you just didn't do anything, would you be better off if you just didn't do anything? So part of the part of the part of so this is a big one. And part of the issue is is that when you don't believe in and the idea of a destiny, of a fate, or this idea of soul, right? Uh, then you're just some, something that's born, and then things happen to you, and then you, your animal in you reacts accordingly. So we take you f- from a sociological perspective. We look and we go, we go you were, um, this happened to you when you were five. So this means that we can predict that, this, that you're going to be on this educational line. And then we predict it. We can predict that you're going to start drinking or doing some type of drug at 16, which means we can predict that you'll get into some kind of law, some kind of legal. And I'm not making what I'm saying up at this point. We can predict by 21 that you're probably going to be in some legal problems. We can predict that you're going to you're going to be uh, die 10, 10 years earlier than someone who isn't on that line. So you're just a reaction. You're just a reaction machine, like a one-celled amoeba. 
that reacts to stimuli. So when you believe in soul, you actually impose, you actually are telling the world around you how to respond to you. That's a completely different, that's a completely different model. That's completely different. Uh, I don't know where we're going. I'm getting old, so I forgot. <laughs> I was going somewhere important, but I, uh, yeah, I even kind of uh, leaned forward. About medication being a Band-Aid. Oh, right. yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I think I said what I was going to say. <laughs> what about the people with the crystals? They, they buy the crystals, and it's supposed to heal your body. What do you take from that? Um, I am really not, I call that spiritual tourism. I think that there's a, there's a word that we've lost in the in, there's a word that we've lost and it's called gnosis g n o s i s mm -hmm. and that's the word where we get knowledge from but gnosis is this idea of when you know something you know something it's kind of like in the movie matrix when um neo is like saying well I don't know if I'm the one or not and then the the uh the oracle tells him well when you're in love you you just you, you just know through and through right that's a gnosis. When you know something, you know it. Yeah. And we've lost, we've lost, we've lost the ability to even believe that we can know something. I, I don't. I because I believe in soul. I believe that um, that I that the world is responding to me, like I was saying before. So this idea of, of all this spiritualism and all this kind of stuff like that, you would never hear. Like let's go back to the Lord of the Rings analogy. Would would Aragorn as the ranger be be concerned about stuff that didn't work, or be be concerned about you know I heard about an orc once. You know it was in the you know I don't care. I know what a, what you know if you're Aragorn you're like I know what an orc is. Yeah. So this is this is what I. This is what I think about. <laughs> <laughs> like we can really know. And the reason we can know is because we're the ones. Who are who are should should be imposing our narrative? A world famous back a hundred years ago, a world famous bullfighter. He was a very small man, and they said he was terrified his whole life. In fact, he was a mama's boy. So if we look at mama's boy socialization, right? He's 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 gonna he's gonna end up you know being a serial killer or a <laughs> or a narcissist and alone or whatever. Whatever the that's fine. But they said he literally hid behind his mother's apron until he was 17. He was terrified. I mean, he was under her in, in the kitchen the whole time. Well, if you believe in soul, then you would say this. This is your conceptual framework for that. If his soul knew that he was gonna be battling 800 pound, you know, beast with horns coming at him, of course he hid behind his mother's apron all that time because he knew what he had to face eventually. This is how, this is how I look at hmm. symptoms. This is how I look at. At, at, at the world that we we're imposing ourselves onto the world. So someone with with depression and they come to you, it's not that you're going to fix them, but you can heal the depression and, and find the trauma that, that that's causing it. We're going to give it a. We're going to find what its meaning is. That's another thing in the kind of a magic nursery that we live in the theoretical framework of the mag. I call it the magical nursery. Uh, think if things are bad, it's because we haven't we haven't homogenized and made everything safe enough yet. So we just, we're just one step closer to being completely safe and pain-free and don't have to worry about anything. And in the soul, and the idea of soul and destiny, um, pain and suffering is inevitable. The only difference is, is, does it have a meaning or not? And right now, everyone is walking around meaningless. Mm. I was adopted, tortured, abused, <laughs> hungry for weeks at a time, homeless, um, couldn't read at 21, uh, chronic pain, lost the few people are all dead that I, that I cared for. Um, my life is beautiful because of it. People don't even, they, they can't even imagine that there's a power, a gnosis like that. Right. That, they're, that their suffering actually has, is something beautiful. We've lost what I call that uh, beatitude. Uh, beatific vision. That's the masculine's gift to love. The feminine's gift to love is soul. And she brings that to us in, 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 in what we would call neuroticism now, but it's not, because that's pathologized. 
it's it's this delicate care looking into things and fretting over things and it's it's soulfulness right and the man's part of love and we've lost this is that beatific vision that our, it's our sight that makes things beautiful and if we don't see that, it, that, that we have that creative instinct to imagine something beautiful like John Lennon's song, right? Then that same vision turns into the Sauron single vision where that the flame of the flaming eye of Sauron in The Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. is sucking all of the fire of life into itself to create a void from whence he came. Mm. And we do that. So... Before we get out of here, um, <laughs> we got to finish this what up. are the videos that you make? Well, I just started trying to make. I, I made one video, and right now I'm making a video series on, um, uh, I'm calling it the uh, Love Apocalypse. Mm. So I want to talk about how we've how we look at love and how we've missed we've missed the magic of it, and that there's a whole world of love that we. Um, that we have no idea about, and I'm using modern movies as um, uh, I'm a in psychology, in depth psychology, or analytical, we call it amplification, where you take a story, or you take a dream, and you amplify it. Or someone tells you something, and you connect it to a larger story, a larger archetype, that's an amplification. And so I'm, I'm, I have what I'm saying in story form, and I'll actually use video uh, movie clips no, as, awesome. I, as I'm talking about the, the uh, the issue, but I'm using love apocalypse because the word apocalypse we view as post-apocalyptic, you know, negative, end of the world kind of stuff. And the word apocalypse means, um, po apocalypse in the Greeks means to submerge, which is that unconscious function, and apocalypse means um, to take out, to uncover, to reveal. Hmm. So through this trauma, through this end of the world type of judgment scene that comes up is actually the revealing of basically everything we've been talking about, the type of the, the sorrows of, of the world are actually the soul revealing itself. How can people find it? I uh, have uh, a YouTube and a Facebook um, self-integration advocate. Okay. I don't have it exactly <laughs> right. with, with, right. you know, with me, but I can give it to you. Maybe you can put it in there. Yeah, for sure. And then how can people find you or, or uh, contact you? Uh, they, can have, they can call my phone number that, or I'm developing a website right oh. now too, but I have, my, I have a Facebook page that has all the information. So that's under um, self-integration advocate. Awesome. All thank right. you for doing this. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the episode. If you enjoyed it, give me a rating and a review on any of the podcast services. Or you could go to my website, alexbehunan.com. Until the next episode, I'll explain later.